All right, so thank you everyone for attending our presentation tonight, uh, Fast and Rough, Minnesota's Hockey Scene in 1920. Uh, the pre presentation will be uh, done today by Jason Rowan, and my name is Matt Carter. I'm executive director for the Dakota County Historical Society. Um, one thing that we are asking is that you at least keep your microphone muted so that there's not a lot of feedback during this presentation. If you want, you're welcome to have the camera on. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we are recording this so that, you know, if you do have your camera on, there's a chance you may make it into the recording. Um, so if you're hoping to avoid that, feel free to keep the, the camera off. Um, because the microphones are muted, we will be using the chat function. So if you're new to Zoom, on the bottom, there's a little menu bar. Um, you can go ahead and uh, find the chat box there. Um, it looks like the shortcut is Alt-H, so anyone that's wanting to, to use that. Any questions you have throughout the presentation, feel free to throw them in there. Um, we'll try and save most of them to the end. That way it kind of keeps the flow of the presentation going. If there is any sort of technical issue that you're coming across, feel free to throw that in the chat box and I'll jump in and um, we'll get that taken care of um, as we go. Um, for this presentation, we do want to thank the Union Pacific Foundation. Uh, we were able to receive a COVID relief grant from them. And with those grants, we've been able to host about 40 different Zoom presentations virtually. Um, from our houses and in other uh, houses from uh, across the country, really. Um, so far, we've had about 800 people register for all of our events. Um, they've represented 30 different states, uh, about 180 different cities all across the country. So we're, we're pretty surprised and, and pleased with the way it's been going and in the turnout and support we've had since COVID hit in March. Um, so looking through here, what we're going to do is again, um, we'll do the presentation and then at the end of it, we'll do some uh, question and answer. So again, feel free as you're going to type those in that chat box in the bottom. Um, so we're joined today by Jason and he is a former communications manager for USA Hockey in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and currently works as director of communications and marketing uh, for the Port Authority in Duluth. Uh, he started his career as a sports writer, editor and page designer with Murphy McGinnis newspapers. He also served as communications director for the United States Hockey League and later director of public relations in the athletic department for the University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, since 1999, he has been a freelance contributor to uh, numerous media outlets that have included minpost.com, ESPN.com, The Hockey News, St. Cloud Times, uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and the Arizona Republic. So we want to thank Jason for taking some time today to share some of his uh, knowledge with us uh, related to Minnesota hockey. Well, thank you for that introduction, Matthew, and thank you all for joining me. It's fun to be able to take a little trip in a hockey time machine tonight and go back to 1920. I also want to thank Roger Godin, the team historian for the Minnesota Wild, and also the United States' is leading hockey historian for the opportunity to make this presentation on a time that I, a, a period in Minnesota hockey that I know is near and dear to his heart. So, so thank you to all. Thanks for joining. And let's take a little trip through 1920. I'm going to share my screen. There we are. How does that look to everyone? Is it good? I'll assume that's a yes. All right. So as Matthew mentioned, my name is Jason Rowan. I am also a member of the Society for International Hockey Research, which is a fantastic group of hockey historians and researchers. And I welcome all of you to check it out if you're interested in this kind of content. There's a wealth of it that the Society for International Hockey Research has been producing for a number of years now. And anyone can join. Um, we have members not only from Canada and the United States, but from all over the world, in fact. So it's a great organization, and you're welcome to join in if you like these kind of presentations. So title of my presentation is Fast and Rough, Minnesota's Hockey Scene in 1920. And it's not an accident that I chose those two words as part of the title. Invariably, if you look at media accounts of well-played competitive hockey games in the 1920s, the term fast is always used to describe the type of hockey that was played. When it was a good game, 
writers were very fond of saying it was a fast game. It was the fastest game that they'd seen in that town in that in so many years. So you'll always see that term. And it's it's just fun because it's so unique to that era when when they weren't necessarily describing just the skating speed, but it was it was a fast game and they were really enamored with that. And of course, it was a rough game and it's still still is a rough game to a certain extent, hockey. But back then it was a, a rougher game in some some aspects. You know, you can see the the image there of Frank Oheen and, you know, you can see the padding was very limited in that era and they clearly weren't wearing helmets or, you know, face masks or anything like that. So, so it was a different game in that regard. It was not uncommon to see confrontations on the ice with referees that would come to come to physical confrontations and even sometimes blows with the referees and things like that. So, so it was a different kind of hockey that was played back then, sometimes on very small sheets of ice that encouraged a lot of body contact and sometimes on very large sheets of ice, far larger than the sheets of ice we're familiar with today that really did the opposite of that and created a lot of open space. So it was a fast game at its best and usually a rough game in 1920. So 1920 was a watershed year. Most people, uh, maybe not most people, but many people, when they think about Minnesota hockey, they think about 1967, perhaps, when the National Hockey League expanded and the Minnesota North Stars made their debut. They think of that as kind of the beginning of hockey in their mind in Minnesota. Some people think of it more in terms of maybe 1945, when the Minnesota State High School Hockey Tournament began, and sort of think that that was kind of the, the beginnings of it for for Minnesota hockey and that long love affair that the state enjoys with the sport now. But really it goes back much farther than that. And a really strong argument can be made that the initial watershed year, the first year, the seminal year in Minnesota's love affair with hockey, maybe was 1920. And we're gonna talk about some of the reasons why that is tonight. Oh, that's not a bad sign. Not a good sign when the slideshow stops. Hang on. There we go. Much better. Sorry about that. So 1920 was a very interesting time in America. It was a dawning of a new decade, obviously, but really a new era in the United States where there were some really seismic changes happening in our country, some really important things happening around the world. And they all had their, had their way of affecting hockey. So the most obvious, of course, was that we were coming out of World War I, which had a major effect on hockey in that it took many potential hockey players out of the country and put them into conflict instead. So, so World War I um, took people out of their communities. It took resources out of communities to be able to play hockey and fund hockey and things like that. So hockey really quieted down during, the, during World War I. And the other major worldwide thing that was happening around that time was the outbreak of the Spanish flu. And as you'll see throughout this, this presentation, the connection with exactly 100 years ago to now is a little eerie in some ways, and certainly the flu being one of them. So the Spanish flu had major effects on, on hockey and the world. And you'll see that play out over the, over the next few slides. Additionally, prohibition began in January of 1920, um, probably less of an effect on hockey, but it was an important part of our country and what was happening at that point in time. So that was another, another factor. We were also amidst this, uh, amid the first red scare and there were sweeping arrests of thousands of so-called, and I'm reading from my notes on this, radical aliens was the quote that you'd see in the newspapers as part of the Palmer raids and the subsequent deportation of hundreds of, of people to Russia via Finland um, on the Buford ship, which you see here on this slide, it was um, nicknamed the Soviet Ark. So we had, we had this, this first red scare happening in our country as well. And it was making top headlines, huge headlines across the newspapers in the United States early in 1920 as well. And then you also had the certification later in 1920 of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. And St. Paul plays a leading role in that, as we'll see later in this slide. So the point is, 1920 was 
really a, a, an amazing year in our country filled with a lot of important seismic events and changes. And some of them affected hockey and it all swept up into a really exciting time for our country. Ringing in the new year. So now we'll get to the hockey. So the year began with a ton of enthusiasm, optimism, and hockey weather. So the war had ended and as a nation, we were welcoming back soldiers and nurses and people who had been in the service. We were welcoming them back into their communities. In Eveleth alone, there were something like 400 people in that community that had been in foreign service during World War I who had come back to that community. And obviously in a town that size, you know, 400 was a lot of people. That was a big chunk of its citizenry that, that had gone to foreign service. So when you're, when you're looking at the January of 1920, you're looking at a time of just great enthusiasm where we're welcoming back soldiers, where we are escaping the darkness of war and looking forward to a brighter time in our country. And we're really right on the cusp of that. And so we're welcoming these soldiers back. And in Eveleth, they hosted a winter sports carnival. And you can see the headlines here. Um, they, they, a year earlier, they had opened their Eveleth Rec Center, an indoor rink, and they staged this giant winter sports carnival to honor the returning soldiers, sailors, and Marines that had been overseas and the nurses and all of the service people from the country. So this event, it had, there was a parade and there was music and dancing and curling competitions. And of course there were hockey games as well. There were hockey games between the teams from Eveleth, Duluth and Hibbing primarily. And it was, it was amidst a, an unbelievable cold snap in the state as well that came perfectly timed to hockey. And one thing that I should point out is that hockey was a much more seasonal game in 1920. It was different than it is today, where in September, teams start reporting to training camp or rookie camp and rookie orientation, and the season really lasts from like October until June or July. Hockey wasn't like that in 1920. Hockey really began in, in late December, and the games would start going in January, and they would play until mid-March, kind of at the latest, and that would be the, the end of hockey season. So, so it was very weather dependent in many places, hockey was. And so January 1920 began very cold in Minnesota. Uh, the te high temperature, the high temperature in Duluth, Minnesota on January 2nd, 1920 was minus 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Eveleth dipped to a low of approximately minus 20. And uh, the high in St. Paul was minus six. So began very cold, which was of course great for making ice. And aided by perfect ice and hockey weather, you start to see these first events of the hockey season happening in 1920, both in towns like Eveleth with this winter sports carnival, and also in the Twin Cities where the Minneapolis and St. Paul hockey leagues were starting up, their youth leagues, their junior leagues, senior leagues were starting up. And when you read the accounts of the newspapers, they use the term enormous crowds coming out to see those games. So not even the highest level of competitiveness that we're talking about here, but enormous crowds coming out to see those games. So you can see the enthusiasm that was building for hockey and also the enthusiasm that was building in the citizens of our country in the beginning of 1920, as our country was emerging from war and the Spanish flu. At the top of the list was the St. Paul Athletic Club. They were, it was the prime team in the area. And about the only thing that could steal headlines from them at that point in time in that January was Babe Ruth, who of course was the biggest name in sports at the time. And just coincidentally to this time that we're talking about here in, in Minnesota's hockey history, it was a huge time in baseball history with Babe Ruth. And I'd be remiss to just not mention that this was when the Boston Red Sox sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. It was happening in this exact time frame that we're talking about here. Um, the, the deal was actually done December 26, 1919, but it wasn't officially announced until January 5th, 1920. And looking at my notes, they've done the calculations on that sale and what it would be worth in today's dollars. And it was approximately $1.4 million in today's money that the, uh, the transaction was for Babe Ruth to go from Boston to New York. So, so that was stealing headlines at this point in time. But the other biggest story, an emerging story on the Minnesota sports scene was the St. Paul Athletic Club. They were the state's best hockey team 
it was a team of largely U.S. born players. And, you know, hockey had been played in St. Paul since the Winter Carnival of 1886. So it had been going on for a while in a, in a formal way in St. Paul, but it hadn't really reached the prominence yet. It was on its way to that through the 19 teens, but it hadn't really reached the prominence that it would find in the 1920s. So the St. Paul Athletic Club played in the American Amateur Hockey Association, and they were led by this incandescent star named Frank Moose, was his nickname, Frank Moose Goheen. He was, he was really Minnesota's first great hockey star. And he had played every position at various times on the ice. This was at a time when hockey was still a seven player game. So a goalie and six skaters. So they were using rovers, cover points, some positions that we're not familiar with now. But throughout 1920 and throughout his career, Goheen would play literally every position. He was a player that could, could skate fast. He was quick. He was about six feet tall, a little under 200 pounds. He was an excellent skater. He was a force in every way. He was a physical force. As you can see in the picture here, square jawed, strong, good looking guy. He was a force to be reckoned with on the ice. He could play the game any way you cut it, any way you wanted to play it, he could do it. And I have some notes. I just, I didn't want to miss anything when it comes to defining what he was as a player. He rejected offers from NHL teams, including the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Boston Bruins at the time. Um, he had a job, he had a good job with Northern States Power in Minnesota. And he had, he had great job security at a time that the National Hockey League salaries really weren't that great. It was a far different era. The league was in its nascent stages. And so so he he really wasn't that tempted to leave that kind of solid, secure day job to go play in the National Hockey League and move and leave his lifestyle that he was accustomed, accustomed to, you know, being from White Bear Lake, Minnesota, being a born and raised, you know, Metro Minnesotan player, like that was his home. And he really wasn't looking to leave that. So he ended up over the course of his career spurning offers from Toronto and Boston in the NHL. And that's just goes a part of the way toward explaining the kind of player that he was, the quality of player that he was um, playing right here in our backyard. He served in the U.S. Army during World War I. Um, at the time of his eventual induction into Toronto's Hockey Hall of Fame in 1952, he was only the second American player to be so honored. And the Hockey News, when they wrote about that induction in 1952, the Hockey News said he was called the best all-around player of his time by many astute hockey followers. So that's high praise coming from a publication that at the time was the foremost hockey publication, not just in the United States, but in North America. Um, he was a member of the inaugural U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame uh, class of 1973. And legendary Minnesota sports writer Halsey Hall had a great quote about him. He said, he wrote once, nothing in sports could ever beat the sight of Moose Goheen taking the puck, circling behind his own net, and then taking off down that rink, leaping over sticks along the way. He was also a fabulous baseball player, as we'll find out later. He played, um, he played, he played baseball in a, in a, in a non-professional sense, but kind of that era where there was probably hat passing going around and he traveled all around North Dakota and Minnesota and Wisconsin playing baseball in the summertime. And he was just in general, a force who lifted his teams, who lifted the state and its hockey followers and lifted really the country, the United States as a hockey nation to new heights. So it's just impossible to, to overstate the importance of Frank Goheen as Minnesota's first great player and as one of the earliest great players in American hockey history. He was foundational. Without Frank Goheen, this may not be the state of hockey. He was that kind of player. He set that kind of foundation for it. So he led his St. Paul Athletic Club team. They played mostly at the 1917-18 built Lexington Avenue rink. And they opened the season on December 30th with a 3-2 win over Duluth in St. Paul before a nice crowd at the time of about 1,600 people. So as we mentioned, Duluth. Duluth was one of the other emerging hockey markets that really took a step forward in 1920. The team that represented Duluth at the highest level was known as the Duluth American Legion team. Uh, 
And it was when you look at the the newspapers of the time and the chronicles of the time, they they mention how Duluth had not had high level hockey throughout the entire war period. Uh, the quote from the Duluth Herald and reads Duluth hockey fans who have been straining at the straps since it was announced several weeks back that the city will have hockey this winter will get their first peek at the strong local septet this evening at the Duluth curling club when they open the season in a real bang up contest with the fast there's that word again the fast hitting seven so that was how the Duluth team opened its season um, opened the home portion of its season after going down to St. Paul and losing that game to the athletic club they opened the home portion of their season by beating Hibbing 11 nothing in its uh, January 5th season opener. That was an exciting game, and it was fun. The, um, the American Legion, as sponsors, they had a brass band as well. And so after the home games throughout the entire season for the Duluth American Legion team, the games were played at the curling club, uh, the spectators were welcome to come out on the ice and skate and the brass band would play march and dance songs and everybody would skate for an hour and just socialize and enjoy their time together. So it was it was really a fun time for hockey in Duluth. And it really swept up not just the players, but also the spectators kind of into one group that supported the game together and just really brought out their enthusiasm during 1920 and brought it to a fever pitch. Uh, the Duluth Herald, after this first series of games um, with Hibbing, there were two games after, and after that, the Duluth Herald said, we don't know much about hockey, having seen only two games in our short but tempestuous existence, but we'll say it's sport with a capital S. The teamwork of the Duluth Seven is not perfect, but the fans got a nice idea of what it will be when the crew has been together a little longer. So you can definitely see the newspaper writers of the era were getting caught up in the excitement as well. The Duluth scene just painting a little broader picture, it went far beyond the American Legion team. The grade school hockey league of Duluth was recently organi organized and it kicked off in 1920. The city recreational department ran it as you see on the slide here. The Western side of the city began play first and then followed by the Eastern side of the city. And then they played throughout the year governed by Spalding's 1920 official hockey rules. Spalding was the leading, the leading rule maker of the era on the American side particularly, but also created these great books of hockey in that era that collected information in an encyclopedic format that were just, they were, they were kind of the Bible of hockey at that point in time. So Spalding was a major name. They also helped manufacture pucks, I believe, at that point in time. Um, so this Duluth League was for players in eighth grade or younger. So now we're really starting to see that youth hockey starting to build up in a more formal way now that the time and resources and people are there behind it after we've come out of war and come out of the flu, we're starting to formalize that youth hockey more and you're starting to see it here. So after, after those initial opening days of January, you see the St. Paul Saints start to open league play. And the photo you see here is, is Nick Kaler, who was St. Paul's only Michigan born player. And he was a huge part of the, the St. Paul Athletic Club team. In fact, he would end this season as its leading goal scorer with 34 goals. He was a huge part, part of that team. So St. Paul opened play in the American Amateur Hockey Association with a two-game sweep of American Sioux. So that would be the American side of Sioux St. Marie. There were two teams in Sioux St. Marie. There was one on the Canadian side and one on the American side. Both of those teams competed against St. Paul and the American Amateur Hockey Association. That was their league of the time. So St. Paul won their, won their opening games um, against American Sioux. They won the first game four to two, um, got off to a great start. And as you can see here, you see another, another quote from the St. Paul Daily News. It just talks about Goheen and what kind of player he was. And you'll see this kind of, this kind of gushing flowery prose about Goheen not only from local publications, but also from publications elsewhere in the country that saw him play. And it just, again, it really, it really brings light to what a dynamic player he was in his era. It's a shame that you know, no video exists to be able to see what he can do. And we just have to rely on these words to be able to imagine it. But, but you can imagine by the, by the stuff you're reading here that he was, he was really a very special player. And you can see that in how he was described in these reports. So St. Paul, not surprisingly, they, the athletic club rolled undefeated through its non-league games in Minnesota. 
Um, they, they beat Duluth twice in mid-January, beat Eveleth, beat Hibbing. And then they only played one more game. That was um, when they hosted Duluth again. They only played one more game against Minnesota-based opponents when they hosted Duluth again in mid-February at the, at the Hippodrome. Um, and so after that, after that run of victories, the St. Paul Pioneer Press proclaimed the athletic club to be Minnesota State or to be the Minnesota State Hockey Champions. And really, it was it was undisputed. Nobody could hold a candle to the talent that the St. Paul Athletic Club had. Um, so it was it was really fun for those teams. I mean, it was challenging and difficult, but it was fun for the outstate teams to take their shots at the athletic club. But nobody could beat them. Bear with me just a minute. I have to get some water. Thank you. So 1920, it was time of a growing game throughout the state. And you, as we mentioned earlier, you could start to see that growth of youth hockey programs throughout Minnesota. And um, there, were, there were games between Duluth, Eveleth, and the other Iron Range communities going on. They had a very thriving rivalry. There was a Virginia team, there was a Hibbing team in that mix, and, and they battled and had tough games. And and when you look back at that Duluth or that Eveleth Winter Carnival and what was said about it in, in the various publications of the time, the uh, Winter Carnival was said to have, quote, surpassed anything in the way of a winter sports program that has ever been held north of the Twin Cities, despite severe cold all three days. Um, the games between Duluth and, and Eveleth were deemed to be the two outstanding features of the Winter Carnival. So despite a, a broad menu of events that they had at that winter carnival, hockey emerged as, as the primary event that they had at that, at that winter carnival. And um, the Eveleth Recreational Building, it was not actually large enough to accommodate everybody that wanted to come watch the hockey games. And the quotes went on to talk about how people climbed up on timber supports across each end of the building and attempt to witness the games. So you can imagine what a scene it must have been in Eveleth surrounding hockey and the passion for it that was that was growing and emerging. And it's 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 fun, you know, you see. You see other newspapers from throughout the United or from throughout Minnesota talking about hockey more and more. And then you started to notice the advertisements in those newspapers, even in places that weren't necessarily the hotbed of hockey that maybe Duluth, Eveleth, or St. Paul was, advertising hockey caps, wool hockey caps. They were they were like a rage of 1920. And you can see advertisements for them in so many different newspapers throughout the state usually ranged in price from like 75 cents to $2, the, uh, the woolen hockey cap that everyone wore out on the rink. And so it's just, it's fun to see the game just growing in prominence in the publications throughout the state at that time. And one of the really prescient quotes in the Eveleth News after that winter carnival and after some of the youth hockey activities had gotten going was the one you can see on the screen here. Eveleth has lots of good material for a hockey team and should make a fine record in the sport. And of course, Eveleth did more than that, you know, in the, in the years to come, they'd win the state's first high school state championship, followed by a string of four more from the late 1940s through the early 1950s and be really the first dynasty of Minnesota high school hockey. So um, something that was a rare thing in newspapers of the day, it was actually understated maybe the, <laughs> the uh, talent that Eveleth had, had growing. When we talk about a growing game, it was growing all over the state and it was certainly growing in the Twin Cities area. And it was very interesting to look at the, the sub headlines, I guess, below the St. Paul Athletic Club. It was far from the only show in town when it came to hockey excitement. And you can see that the, um, the, the Twin Cities leagues were also emerging both at the, at the youth level and also at the senior level and above. Um, at the youth level, one of the prospects was a future University of Minnesota skater named Ken Brose. He skated for a Twin Cities junior team named the Raccoons, which my daughter loves that name and subsequently wants to name her hockey team that. Um, he, on January 2nd, he scored six of his team's eight goals. He was, he was a big time player and would go on to be a gopher in the period just before varsity, just before hockey became a varsity sport at the University of Minnesota. And interestingly, Frank Goheen helped officiate these junior outdoor games. And the newspapers talk about the great crowds of spectators that came out to watch these, these youth games essentially that were being played as well. So it was, uh, it, was, it was a game that was growing at all levels. You can see that inner fraternity hockey. So it would be similar to maybe what we'd call club hockey or intramural hockey at the colleges today, 
was beginning at the University of Minnesota at that time. And there were big interfraternity games. And the University Ag School also had a hockey team. And in fact, um, it's, it's goalie. Let me rephrase that. A student from four years prior who had been at the university's ag school actually went on to become the St. Paul Athletic Club's goalie for this 1920 season. So uh, the ag school was looking to, to launch, relaunch a hockey team after one had gone fallow for a few years for a number of reasons like we've talked about already. So, so you see hockey growing at multiple levels. And um, it's really an exciting thing to see it. You know, it's not just it's not just a semi pro game. It's also really starting to grow at the youth levels and formalize as well. So like we talked about earlier in the presentation, this was a tremendous time of change in our country. And one of the major changes was that women gained the right to vote. The 19th Amendment passed in in August of 1920. And South St. Paul's women were the United States first to vote, actually, after that certification of the 19th Amendment. They helped pass a waterworks bond referendum on August 27th, 1920. Uh, in all, 90 women voted. Marguerite Newberg was credited with casting the first vote. So the first woman to cast an official vote in the United States, St. Paul's Marguerite Newberg. And months earlier, women were already flexing their muscle on the ice um, playing hockey during the University of Minnesota's Winter Carnival. So that would be in January of 1920. And you can see this time of change in our country as women are gaining the right to vote and embarking on the flapper era. And it had an effect on the ice. Sorry. It had an effect on the ice that was really evident during the University of Minnesota Winter Carnival, which opened January 24th, 1920 with a fraternity hockey game and then followed by a women's hockey game between the red team and the green team. And it was, it was such an event that the Minneapolis Sunday Tribune actually sent a photographer and captured these great photos of, of these women playing hockey that you can see here. And this, this in an era when newspaper photography was extraordinarily expensive and not something that was done lightly. It was a serious endeavor if they were gonna send a, a photographer and chronicle an event, a local event, with this kind of coverage in terms of writing and photography. So you can see that this, this game was, was an important thing in, in our state and in the development of hockey. It was one of the first women's hockey competitions that really captured widespread attention. And as you can see, the red team won three to nothing, and there was, quote, a storm of applause and enthusiastic backing from the student onlookers. And the game was marked with clever teamwork from the beginning to ending whistle. So they talked about it and not only did they talk about it, but they talked about it with respect and admiration for the quality of play that was out there. And that too was something that was different for that era. And it was just really great to see that. And you can see this, this example of increased um, participation and acceptance of girls and women in vigorous sports like hockey. And you can start to see that in, in the 1920s, in the early stages of the 1920s, as that's starting to, to grow and emerge. So it was a foundational time for hockey. And it was, as part of that, it was also a foundational time, really a seminal time for girls and women's hockey in the state as well. Probably the time when it was at its most popular, it peaked for a time very strongly until various things including subsequent wars kind of tamped it down. And then it's taken until, you know, until the last 20 to 25 years before it's been able to reemerge in such a strong way. And as we talked about earlier, the, the parallels with exactly 100 years ago are, are somewhat eerie. And there was also, oh, sorry. <laughs> I wanna back up and mention one thing. Uh, I don't wanna move on too quickly. Um, as a result of the, as you can see in the bottom, uh, the bottom nugget on this slide, as a result of this great enthusiasm of this event with the interfraternity hockey game and the women's hockey game um, at this outdoor winter carnival, it was, it, it brought pressure on the university authorities for the recognition of varsity hockey and ski teams at the University of Minnesota. So at that time, hockey was played at the University of Minnesota, but it was not recognized as a varsity sport yet. And when when the media and when the university and when spectators saw how much enthusiasm there was for the game, 
um, for, for the men's game and for the women's game, it opened their eyes to the fact that hockey was emerging in a way that it had never emerged before. And it began that, that groundswell of, of pressure and enthusiasm that eventually helped the University of Minnesota take varsity status with hockey and become the power that it ultimately became. So back to the parallels, the February flu. So the Spanish flu had a major impact on the world of hockey, um, canceling the Stanley Cup final in April of 1919. They actually played some of the games but did not finish the final because of the Spanish flu in 1919. And in fact, a, a player died because of it. Um, and it, it was a huge, it's a huge scourge on North America, on the world. And it definitely affected, affected hockey. And when we were getting into 1920, we were emerging from the Spanish flu as a society, but there, we weren't all the way there yet. It wasn't still completely in the rear view mirror. And so there were still flu prevention protocols that were affecting hockey and basketball in Minnesota during the winter of 1920. And I'll just talk about, I'm just gonna read a few accounts here that came from newspaper reports throughout the country. So um, we're talking early February, 1920 here in the Duluth Herald. On account of the influenza, influenza ban on outsiders, nobody but Eveleth people were admitted to the game, um, a 5-1 win for Eveleth over Duluth. Um, in Eveleth, there were about a thousand spectators at the Eveleth Recreational Building, but only people from Eveleth were allowed to attend. No one from Duluth was allowed to go. The police were actually posted outside the facility, outside the recreational building, checking people and, and only allowing locals, only allowing Eveleth people to come into the game. Um, the Eveleth, Eveleth News talked about it as well. Um, Eveleth school authorities are confident that they chose the best method when they did not close the school because of the flu. In that way, all children were watched and a check was kept on the sickness in more cases than if the schools had been closed. So you're seeing these headlines and um, editorials that are eerily similar to the conversations that we're having today and the things that we're reading about today. Um, Dr. King, this is in Eveleth again, Dr. King reports that no difficulty was experienced in keeping out of town people from attending public meetings, shows and the hockey games, but a close check was kept on them by police and a few passed by. So a few snuck in and high school basketball games, all high school basketball games on the Iron Range were canceled for a period of a few weeks in late um, January, early February of 1920. And um, some Duluth Central basketball games were canceled as well. And there was a lot of uncertainty among hockey and basketball teams as they were kind of coming down the stretch in their season of if they were gonna be able to have their games played. And if so, if their home fans were gonna be able to travel with them and attend the games. And that led into March. And thankfully, things eased up in March. And that was great. The, um, by late February, the flu restrictions started to ease. The number of case counts, although they didn't use that term back then, had begun to diminish and it really opened up hockey to be able to have have its traditional kind of march to the finish and it really was a march to the finish in march because as we mentioned earlier that's when the season ended largely and i think this quote from the saint paul dispatch is another one of those quotes that really well well explains the kind of passion that had built for hockey in 1920 Hockey occupies the center of the sports stage at present in St. Paul for dazzling speed, for sensation and thrill after thrill, the great ice game cannot be beaten. And you can see just the, the glowing terms that the newspapers were using about the sport and speaking about it, writing about it in a way that just wasn't common before that. So the St. Paul Athletic Club ended up rolling to a nine and three league record. Um, however, they were forced to share the championship with Canadian Sioux despite posting a three to one head to head advantage in games against that team. Um, but they ended up with the same record and the way things were in leagues like that back then, that was how it ended. However, um, they, they planned to do a playoff between those two teams, which was the source of some contentiousness even before the snowstorm started, but then, then severe snowstorms came and they forced the cancellation of the proposed playoff. So it never happened. But as the defending McNaughton cup champions, 
And you may be familiar with McNaughton Cup from today's college hockey play for it. It started as a trophy for this league. Um, as defending McNaughton Cup champions, St. Paul was able to retain the trophy. Um, elsewhere in the state, Eveleth came to Duluth and swept the two-game series, which was a bit of a surprise, but Eveleth had fortified its roster with some, some imports, some ringers, and uh, really, really came out and played, played bang up hockey in Duluth and took a couple game series to forge a six, six tie in the season series. So the newspapers at the time were calling that the St. Louis County championship and the teams had to split it. However, things got better for Duluth because in early March, they were visited by two Winnipeg teams. The first was the Winnipeg Monarchs, which featured future NHLers, Ching Johnson and Perk Galbraith. They came to Duluth and um, Duluth won two to one before a crowd of more than a thousand. And you can see there the Duluth Herald called it the city's greatest game since the pre-war era. So, and then riding high off that, then Manitoba's senior league champions, which were called the Winnipegs, they came to the Zenith city and also lost to Duluth. Uh, Duluth won four to three in the second overtime period. Um, back then the overtimes were not um, golden goal or sudden death. They were a period of time that would be played out. And then if there was no decision, they'd play another period of time. It'd be played out. And if you scored a goal, it didn't necessarily end the game. It just, the game played out for the remainder of the overtime period. Um, so, so the Duluth team won four to three in the second overtime period. Again, good crowd of a thousand. And then in the second game of the series, Duluth won again in two overtime, seven to five. Um, Duluth lost the third and final game two to one. And you can, you can see in the headlines now, I mean, we're getting into that time of year. The water was pooling up over the curling club ice. They said it had a major effect on the game that Duluth lost, not necessarily hindering Duluth, but hindering both teams because it was getting warm outside. And even inside the curling club, they couldn't maintain the ice at that point very well. Um, but these, these three victories in four games by Duluth over Winnipeg opponents were viewed as huge upsets and actually were talked about in other publications throughout the state that um, were, were shocked at these, at these wins for Duluth. So, so they were really a plant your flag in the ground kind of victory for the Duluth team and a great way to cap the season for Duluth and really, really put a cap on that enthusiasm as well and then burst it off with these victories and it was, it was just a great way to, um, to salute the fans and a great way to end the season for the players, but then build enthusiasm for the coming seasons. So to the South, um, the St. Paul Athletic Club finished, finished through its schedule and then went to Pittsburgh, which um, for a three game series and ultimately it amounted to an Olympic evaluation series. There were, there were really three teams in the United States that were viewed as being the caliber of team that could potentially represent the United States as an Olympic hockey team. But ultimately the officials involved decided that no one of those teams could really represent the United States at the highest level. So they chose to take a mix, a blend of players from those teams and create an Olympic team. So, so the athletic club went to Pittsburgh for what amounted to the, uh, to an Olympic evaluation series. St. Paul won the first game and then lost two games, um, ended the season at 17 and six overall. But here you see an instance of, of Frank Goheen getting that praise, not just from the hometown newspapers, but from the Pittsburgh press as, as well. Um, you can see the quote there, just uh, very, very poetic, talking about uh, romantic nights of, of a Shakespearean era. <laughs> um, and, and then the, cap, the kicker at the end with Goheen, the Marvel, you know, and it was just, uh, it, was, it was emblematic of the way that, that he played the game, evidently, when you can see not only the hometown press giving him the love, but the opposing press in completely different markets getting their first look at him and just being overwhelmed with complimentary praise for him as well. So we talked about the Olympics. Another part of what made 1920 such a important watershed year in American hockey and in Minnesota hockey was that 1920 happened to be the first ever, the debut of ice hockey in the Olympics. And there was actually only the Summer Olympics in Antwerp, um, and that's where hockey was, was debuted. Uh, it happened in April 1920. Uh, in in mid-April, the team that they, that they assembled to play in that tournament and represent Team USA 
They were welcomed in Antwerp, Belgium at an elaborate welcome, they, they said in the newspaper, for the US hockey and skating teams at the American embassy. And that was about the last of the elaborate treatment for the American hockey team, as it turned out. Um, as, as you read accounts of, of this event, you, you see that the accommodations weren't, weren't great, the food wasn't great, and even, even the way that the players were treated by the officials of the US hockey team was kind of shabby. Um, just some, you know, in some financial ways, making them making them pay for some expenses and things that just it, put it this way, it wasn't necessarily a, an environment conducive to championship hockey. However, the the first ever U.S. Olympic hockey team uh, certainly rose to that challenge and overcame it largely. The team included four players from the St. Paul Athletic Club, as, as it turned out, Tony Conroy, Frank Oheen, Eddie Fitzgerald and Cyril Weidenborner, who we mentioned earlier was the player who had played in the early days of the University Agriculture School and was the goalie for St. Paul and would be the second goalie for the U.S. Olympic team. And uh, that, that trio, as it were, of skaters would account for slightly more than half of all the Team USA goals at the Olympics that year. So they, uh, they were more than just players on the roster. They were huge components of the American Olympic team. And you can see by the scores here, the lopsided nature of, of play with uh, the U.S. beating Switzerland 29-0, beating Czechoslovakia in the final game 16-0. Um, there, there, um, there was a great quote that, again, was just glowing from the Associated Press about Frank Oheen. It said, in spite of the wonderful work of Frank Oheen and Tony Conroy of the United States here tonight, the Americans were sent down to defeat before a crowd which packed every nook and corner of the ice palace. So again, you see that that enthusiasm for hockey spreading worldwide in 1920, um, and the obviously unfortunate defeat for the American side um, at the hands of Canada. The only defeat that the Americans suffered, but once again, another one of those important moments where Frank Oheen was was among the shining stars, even even in a losing effort. And um, in some of the great accounts of that tournament, you, uh, you see that, that Frank Oheen actually was um, a, a little apologetic about how dominant he was in some of those games, so much so that he actually refrained from shooting um, in, some of, in some of the games, particularly the like Switzerland and Czechoslovakia games, because it had gotten so one-sided and the Americans were so clearly superior to their opponents that, that Frank was actually afraid of injuring one of the players on the other team. So he, he really tried to demur and stop shooting the puck and, and just kind of be a perimeter player and, and not play with his usual zeal. So kind of hard to imagine going to an Olympics and taking your foot off the gas, but that's exactly what he had to do in some of the games because he was just so dynamic of a player. As you can see in the picture on the left here, this is um, an excerpt from Roger Godin's book. And this is Frank Goin's jersey from uh, jersey and, and medal from the Olympics that year. Uh, Tony Conroy finished as the leading U.S. scorer. So one of the St. Paul players finished as the leading scorer with 14 goals in four games. Good output there. Definitely would be good in plus minus if they kept that stat back then. And Goheen had seven goals. Uh, Fitzgerald scored once. And Weidenborner played solid when he was called upon as the second goaltender. He did get playing time. Obviously, in those blowout situations, there was plenty of that to go around. So he played well, and you can see the um, you can see the rink here. It's just kind of a nice shot to get you a sense of what the rink looked like. Obviously, a, sm a far smaller surface there than what we would be accustomed to playing on in an Olympic setting today, where it would be a 200 by 100 foot surface of ice. So then we go into the future. So hockey would continue growing, but before that, players like Frank Oheen and Eddie Fitzgerald from the athletic club had to move on to their jobs, of course, but also playing baseball. It was, it was almost summer, April was coming on. And so, you know, these athletes were largely multi-sport athletes in those days, which is, is a great thing. And, and to see them move from one sport to the next and enjoy the passion of a new season, so um, uh, Frank and Eddie, they actually went to uh, went to Valley City, North Dakota that summer and uh, picked up the baseball gloves and played, you know, semi-pro town ball baseball until until the following fall when they, of course, came back and 
brought the skates out again and rejoined the St. Paul team. And buoyed by the, the success and the enthusiasm and the growth of the game in 1920, a new league launched in 1921 named the United States Amateur Hockey Association. And in that new league, Duluth, Eveleth, and St. Paul would compete. Eveleth and St. Paul would go on to win what would be known as like a division championship today in subsequent seasons. So they had, they had success in that, in that new league. And it was a, it was a large league and involved, you know, Pittsburgh and Cleveland. So it was the highest level of hockey in our country at the time. And it was really something that had grown out of the enthusiasm and the success of 1920. Now, when you fast forward to the 1930s, we enter into that time of the Dust Bowl and you know the Great Depression and finances became very difficult. And unfortunately, then as now, hockey is not an inexpensive sport. It was difficult to maintain facilities. It was difficult to maintain ice. It was difficult to travel. It was difficult to buy equipment. And you could definitely see the effect of the Great Depression and, and those dark times of the 30s on hockey. It definitely tamped down some of the enthusiasm and really contracted the game in Minnesota and throughout the United States. Um, the game did survive the 1930s, particularly at the college level in Minnesota, um, where you start to see in, in the early to mid 1930s, a, a dynasty of sorts emerge at St. Cloud Teachers College with um, on the back of a goaltender that you may have heard of named Frank Brimzik, who would go on to be, of course, Mr. Zero and a star for the Boston Bruins in later years, um, another Eveleth native. Um, so at, at, the, at the college level, the game kind of kept on trucking through the 1930s, though it was difficult, but you really see it starting to um, start to erode a little bit at, at other levels. And of course the emergence of the NHL during that time took some of the shine off the, uh, the senior amateur game and kind of ended the, the amateur game as, as a prominent form of hockey in the United States. Um, additionally, the University of Minnesota was very strong in the 1930s as well. And you see uh, University of Wisconsin being involved in that as well at the time. So, so the college game was kind of where it was at in Minnesota during the 1930s. Then the 1940s, of course, we entered World War II and the same, you know, many of the same brand of challenges that befell the game during World War I came back in the 1940s. And you, you see that again, kind of, kind of limiting the growth of the game in the early part of the 40s. But then in 1945, you have the first Minnesota State High School hockey tournament. And that excitement starts to build again. And then from there, you have the 1950s and that prosperity and everything just keeps building and growing with that prosperity that America experienced through the 1950s. And then of course that bridges you to 1960 and the Squaw Valley Olympics and the first gold medal for the United States Olympic team um, brought, you know, by large contributions from St. Paul players, from Minnesota players. And that new awakening where 1960 really opened the country's eyes to a certain extent of what we could be as a hockey nation. And then just seven years after that, you have the expansion of the National Hockey League and the dawn of the Minnesota North Stars here in Minnesota. And at that point, I think you could really say that hockey had reached critical mass finally in Minnesota, where, where it was, it was self-sustainable and had so much, so many resources and so much love and passion and so many people involved that it really wasn't ever going to take a step back again. And in fact, it did not. It only kept growing and getting stronger and getting better and emerging into the force that it is today, the state of hockey. And that was really, that was something that I think you can definitely draw a line all the way back through these eras. But really, when you get to 1920, you see that that is really where it began. And like I said at the beginning, I think you can make a strong argument that 1920 was the watershed year in what would end up becoming Minnesota's march to become the state of hockey. So that's the conclusion of my formal presentation here. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and then I just have a couple additional comments. I would be remiss if I did not once again mention Roger Godin. 
the foremost hockey historian in the United States, much of the material, particularly on the St. Paul Athletic Club that was contained in my presentation comes from Roger's book, Before the Stars. I would highly recommend this to anyone who is, who is interested in this topic and interested in how the, the roots of Minnesota hockey were really planted. It's a fantastic book. And Roger was, was the first director of the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame and is just a, an absolute fountain of knowledge and passion for the game of hockey and for Minnesota hockey. And it, his contributions are just like unmatched by anyone else. And he was a huge help in, being, in my being able to give this presentation to you tonight. So just want to thank him for all the, all the contributions he's made to being the historian of this game in the United States. And I'll open it up to any questions you may have. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. That was a, a great presentation and a lot of information to get through. Um, so I just for those of you that, um, you know, if there was any issue hearing the, the book title or anything, I did put that in the chat box. So if you are interested in checking that out, um, feel free to go down to the chat box there um, and you can find the title and the author's name right there. And I also want to thank Roger for uh, getting um, us in touch with Jason to come in and do this presentation. So um, again, thank you to Roger for that. Um, one question that did come in um, with the United States Amateur Association or Hockey Association, um, was there any connection to that and what we know today as USA Hockey? A dotted line. People sometimes like to, um, sometimes they confuse it with what we know today as USA Hockey. It is not the same entity at all. Um, USA Hockey was founded far later than that. That league actually ceased operation um, later in the 20s. It ceased operation. So um, there is no direct correlation or no direct connection between that league, despite the name, and what we know of today as USA Hockey. Okay. Um, one other question, and, and this one's, you know, my, my question um, before the presentation started, Jason and I were talking that uh, Dakota County Historical Society has a vintage baseball team um, that plays by the rules of 1860, which is, it's fun to watch. It's a lot different than what we're used to today. You know, what were some of the different cha rule changes that, you know, you know, from 1920 to 2020, obviously the helmets, um, you showed some pictures of the ice rinks. Um, what were some of those major things that, you know, as we watch today that may look different um, back in 1920. One thing you'd see right away was that rather than having goal judges off the ice surface with, you know, a switch to turn on a red light, you had goal judges standing on the back of goal cages with a bell and they'd ring a bell when, when goals were scored. So that was one thing that was visually very different about the game. Also, there was no forward passing allowed in, in the game. Um, at that point in time. So it was, it was definitely a different styled game in that regard, a lot more carrying the puck necessary. And, um, you know, there were different, there were different nuances as to where body checking was allowed. Um, it was only allowed in certain zones of the ice instead of all over the ice, the way you see it today. So, and, and as we mentioned during the presentation, there was, there was an extra player on the ice. And later in the St. Paul Athletic Club season, they actually had to play some games where um, teams from you know other places or other countries would would want instead to play with five skaters or you know so I mean it would be a, they'd have to adjust on the fly all of the teams of the era did sometimes when they were playing teams from other countries or teams that had just grown accustomed to playing the game a certain way so sometimes there'd be more skaters on the ice fewer skaters on the ice and I think probably the most prominent thing you'd see is that this was not an era of four forward lines and three defensive pairs. That was not happening at this point in time. You know, even in the 1930s, the, um, the, the St. Cloud Teachers College team that I mentioned, they had like seven players. They played the whole game, you know, like they had one, one sub and he'd barely see the ice, you know. So this was an era when you were really, it was, it was a time when you needed to be in good shape to be able to play the game. Not that you don't today, of course, but you know, there was, there was no, there was no line changing and that kind of stuff happening, you know, for the most part, these were, these were kind of Ironman hockey days. Excellent. No, definitely. Uh, having one sub on the bench would be a lot different today. Um, you know, right now there aren't any additional questions or, or comments. You know, there is a comment in the, the chat box right now that said it was a fantastic presentation. So, 
uh, you know, the good thing is I wasn't the only one that thought that. So um, if there are no more questions, we'll give it a couple more minutes um, to wrap up. What we'll be doing is, you know, like I said, this was recorded. So we will have this available on our YouTube channel. And uh, within the next day or so, we'll try and get that uploaded. And then we'll send a link to anyone that registered, whether they were able to attend it or not. Um, and we'll have a link to that video on our, on our channel, as well as a link to a survey. And we just ask that you take a, a literally two to three minutes. Um, it's less than 10 questions. So take a couple of minutes, fill that out, let us know how we did. Um, and one of the other things, and we've used this in, in the past, is if you have any ideas for other programs you'd like to see, throw those in, you know, in the comment, or if you want to send me an email directly, um, you know, we, we're always looking for programs that you'll be interested in. Um, so if you do have any ideas, definitely either include that in the survey or reach back out. And with that, I see no more questions. So again, we'll, we'll end by thanking Jason. Uh, it was a great presentation. I highly recommend checking out the book as well. Um, and if you have any questions or um, any comments, issues, anything along those lines, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, within the next day or so, we'll be sending out that link to the video. So there were a couple, one that see a couple questions in. coming in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, first so, of all, before, yeah. before anything else, just thank you all for you know spending spending some time with me tonight. It was great to share some hockey enthusiasm with you all. I, I just I appreciate your time and spending time with me. Looking at the questions I see coming up, beyond Sir, do you have any other recommended resources for hockey related research? One thing that immediately comes to mind would be the website Vintage Minnesota Hockey. Uh, vintagemnhockey.com. <laughs> I can't remember the exact handle, but if you if you Google search vintage Minnesota hockey, you'll you'll get to this website. It's maintained by another great hockey historian in, in this state who does tireless work and has put together so many great resources. If you haven't seen it, you'll love it. It's vintage Minnesota hockey. Look it up. It's a great website. It covers the the broad spectrum of the game. Everything that you could possibly be interested in in Minnesota hockey is on there. He's done a, he's just done a fantastic job um, putting, putting that site together through the years. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll piggyback off of that. It's also a fantastic follow on Twitter. Um, a number of the images and just anecdotes that they share um, definitely worth it. So check out the Twitter handle for them and the uh, website at the same time. Bear with me just a minute. I'm actually going to, uh, Kyle is the gentleman's name who, who runs it. And I'm going to grab the link for us here. Copy. And I will paste it into the chat to everyone right now. There we go. All right, so definitely feel free to check that out. And what we'll try and do is we'll try and include that link as well as a link to Roger's book um, in our, our follow-up at the same time. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll end by, uh, again, thank you, Jason. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have some hockey back on soon that we can uh, all enjoy. If nothing else, you can always rewatch this presentation. So um, Thank you, Jason, and uh, everyone have a, a good rest of your evening and, and stay safe. Be well, everyone. Take care. Thank you.